Hello and welcome back. So today I want to continue talking about near field probing. And since last time we covered electric field probes, today it's time for magnetic field probes. So what I want to do today is look at how magnetic fields can be generated in a controlled fashion, how to detect them using a magnetic field probe, and then look at the practical circuit and see what sort of different information we can get on one hand with the magnetic field probe and on the other with the electric field probe. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So to start things off, we need to generate some magnetic fields. And the easiest way to do that is by using a coil. So something like this. Now, the only problem with this sort of coil is that the magnetic fields wrap around it, so they bend from one pole to the other, and then the field lines extend to infinity. And the problem with the outside of the coil is that the magnetic field is not very uniform. So first of all, it has this bending effect, and also the further away you go from the coil, the weaker the signal gets. On the other hand, inside of the coil, the magnetic field is fairly straight and uniform. The only problem with this coil is that you can't really get your probe inside of it. There's windings in the way. So to solve this issue, what you can do is build this sort of thing. So what this is called is a Helmholtz coil, named after the German physicist Hermann von Helmholtz. Basically, it's two separate coils that are identical and that are spaced apart by half their diameter. The idea behind this thing being that you still get your magnetic fields wrapping around it, but inside you get a fairly uniform and straight field. And this time you actually can enter in there. So you can actually insert your probe into the uniform magnetic field. So other than the coils, I just had to add a 100 ohm resistor, that was because when I connected this to my power amplifier, the whole thing started oscillating. So let's try this thing out and see just how uniform the fields are. So to sense the field created by one coil, basically what you can use is another coil. So what I got here is five turns of wire that have an SMA connector on the other side. And this I can now connect to my oscilloscope. So to run this experiment, I prepared this little setup. So what I got here is my power amplifier, which on one hand is giving a signal into the second channel of the oscilloscope, and on the other side it's giving a signal into my Helmholtz coil. And on the first channel, I will be attaching my magnetic field probe. So if we connect the two, we see that there's a bit of noise, we'll get into that in just a moment. And now if we insert the probe into the Helmholtz coil, we see that we get a very nice response. Now, ignoring the noise, regardless of where the probe is sitting inside of the coil, so if it's to the left, to the right, higher, lower, it's basically got the same amplitude. So we got our fairly uniform magnetic field. And we can also use the probe to see how the field is bending around the coil. And that is because this sort of magnetic field probe is directional, meaning that it's important how it is aligned with the magnetic field. So when I insert it into the uniform magnetic field, the field lines are basically parallel and horizontal. And as long as I'm keeping my probe perpendicular to these lines, so the plane in which the windings are is perpendicular to the field lines, I get a nice response. Once I start turning the coil, even though the magnetic field is exactly the same, the response starts to decrease. And finally, when my probe is aligned with the magnetic field lines, I get absolutely no response. And then if I turn it a bit more, then I get my signal back. And we can use the same trick on the outside. So if we want to see what way the field is pointing in this particular point, we simply need to turn the probe until we get the maximum response. So roughly around there. So I can safely say that the magnetic field is bending through the probe in the upward direction. 
so just as we would expect it to go around the coils. Now regarding the noise, there's two aspects to consider. First of all, this is a low impedance probe, which is unlike the electric field probes which were high impedance, this needs a low impedance matching on the other end of the cable. So right now I have my low impedance probe connected to a 50 ohm cable connected to a 1 mega ohm input impedance of the oscilloscope. And since we are having an impedance mismatch, it's oscillating, it's ringing and there's a lot of noise in there. So if you have an oscilloscope that has a 50 ohm impedance built in then you can select that, otherwise you can add it. So what I got here is a T connector with a 50 ohm impedance on one side and on the other I will be connecting my probe. And by doing this we can already see that most of the noise has disappeared, but if we reinsert our probe into our field generator we can still see our response. So the probe is still working, it's still sensing the magnetic field, but it's no longer picking up all that noise. Now. There's one more source of noise that can get into your probe. For example, if I hold it in my hand, we can see that we got all our noise back. And basically, what you want with a magnetic field probe is for it to pick up magnetic fields, hence the name. You don't want it picking up electric fields. You got your electric field probes for that. Basically, I'm not generating magnetic fields, I, I, you can't stick spoons to me or something, no, 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 I don't do that. But I am generating electric fields, because the human body is conductive. So what is going on right now is that the probe is also picking up electric fields. So to handle that, what you need is some sort of shielding around your probe. And for that I built this probe. It also has exactly 5 turns, just like the first one, it's roughly the same diameter, but what the difference is with this one is that I also added a shield made from aluminum tape. Now it's not the perfect shield, it's just for demonstrative purposes, but there's one important detail to mention about this. And that is that you should never put your shield all the way around the probe. In my case I have this cut here in the middle where the shield doesn't close. And that is important because you want your shield to shield the electric fields, but you don't want to add an extra turn that is short circuited in parallel with your sensing probe. So this cut here basically acts as a gap so that you don't have a complete turn in the same alignment as your sensing probe. So if we now take this probe and I put my hand around it, well there's no more noise. I mean there is some noise but it's far far lower. The reason being is that I didn't really make a very good shielding job, but that's my fault. The point is we still get the exact same response of the probe, but with far less electric field noise. Now, from a constructive point of view, there's one more thing to mention. In this case, I used 5 turns. And adding more turns to your probe will help with increasing sensitivity, because for the same amount of magnetic field you will get a higher voltage, but the downside is that a coil with multiple turns will have a higher interwinding capacitance, and that will lead to a probe that has a limited bandwidth. So as long as you want to measure low frequency fields, then adding more turns is no problem, but if you want a probe that goes to very high frequencies, then you will want to reduce the number of turns. In particular, you can make a single turn sensing probe, and to prevent any sort of oscillations and impedance mismatches, build it from 50 ohm coax cable. Now, some commercial probes are actually built from 50 ohm controlled impedance traces, but you need a PCB for that. But on the other hand, you can also make it from simple coax. And this sort of probe can go into the gigahertz range. So this sort of sensing probes will have a very very high bandwidth. Now the final constructive feature to mention is the use of magnetically conductive materials, like ferrites for example. So what I got here is a little probe in which I used a little ferrite rod and I made some turns around it. And the idea behind this is that depending on the way in which your ferrite is pointing and the exact shape of your ferrite, you can concentrate magnetic fields into your sensing coil. So when I built this thing, I was especially interested in measuring magnetic field lines which are pointing straight up, so perpendicular from a PCB for example. 
somewhere where this sort of coil would be quite difficult to get in because of all the other components, you can simply come with this tiny little probe and directly probe on top of your component of interest. Now of course the same rules will apply to get a good probe, so more turns equals more sensitivity but also more capacitance which limits bandwidth, you will still need some sort of shielding to protect it from electric field and you still need to take care of the impedance on the probe and the cables and the sensing apparatus to remove any sort of oscillations and ringings and so on. So let's try out all these probes and see what sort of information we can get from a practical circuit. So what I got here is a power supply from an old telephone charger. Basically it's outputting 5 volts into a 10 ohm load, so there's some load to it. And I'm supplying it with a high voltage. So if we take our first probe, so we take the 5 turns that is shielded, and we start going over the supply, we see that it's picking up quite a lot of signal. So let me just adjust this a bit, change this time scale, and we can see that we're getting quite a nice response around the transformer. So the closer I go to the transformer, the stronger the signal gets. If I move away from it, then the signal starts to decrease. So you can see that most of the signal is concentrated in this switching area. Now if I try to change the angle, we see that we barely get any sort of response. So we can see the probe directionality. If my probe is standing perpendicular to the board, there's almost no signal. Whereas if I turn it around, then I get a very, very strong response. And also I can go around it and see various shapes here and there. There's basically nothing around the load and there's, again, almost nothing on the input side. Well, just a little bit. Now, if we turn to the single turn probe, basically we get a much smaller response this time because there's only one turn rather than five. We get most of the same signals, so we have a very strong signal around the transformer. And as we move further away, there's less and less signal. Again, directionality is quite an important topic. So depending on the angle at which I'm holding the probe and exactly where it is, the signal will change. Finally, we can take our tiny probe with the ferrite rod. With this probe, we can actually get down close to the PCB. So because of its tiny size, we can actually insert it in between components and look at individual parts here and there. And the final thing to try is of course, take the electric field probe and look at the exact same region on the board. So if I take my tiniest electric field probe, turn it on of course, go over the transformer, both with the electric field probe and the magnetic field probe, we start to see some interesting results. So let me just take a single capture. So what we can see here with the electric field probe is the typical waveform associated with a flyback supply. So we have the switch turning on and then oscillating. But on the other hand, with the magnetic field probe, we see a slightly different waveform. So we see that these sharp switching actions are causing a lot of magnetic noise. And especially in the magnetic field, we see that there's an oscillation going on, which is not visible in the electric field probe. So different parts of your noise spectrum can be observed with different types of field sensors. Now, of course, to get a really good result, you will need a good set of probes, you will need a proper spectrum analyzer. But if you're on a tight budget, you can get away with making some really good measurements, even with probes that you make yourself. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.